Okay. Hi, parents. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew. I am the founder of Cheer.com. And right, we have um, yeah, quite a number of lessons going on every week. We uh, wanted this workshop to bless the parents and the students, especially our students, to get to know um, about the COVID-19, the crisis, the virus, and also about medical profession. Okay, so we are very honored to have Dr. Tan today here with us. So you have already seen his uh, picture and posters and his uh, credential. So, um, you know, I'll not take a long, long time to introduce him to you. Yeah, so very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a Sunday afternoon and thanks for coming down to uh, attend the, this workshop. Okay, it's a very short workshop. So a couple of weeks ago, he uh, actually asked me whether I can help to uh, give this a little bit update about uh, COVID virus as well as um, for those who are interested uh, or, you know, to in the medical career, I'm here to um, provide maybe some advice or guidance. If you have any questions later on, uh, we can talk about it. Yeah, so uh, today's talk um, will be on COVID and uh, up and downs of uh, medical career. So before I start, maybe just make a little introduction on myself. Uh, huh? So I'm a family physician uh, uh, working in the clinic in uh, Topayo, near to Brother MRT. Uh, and um, I spend 50% of my time uh, in the clinic. My other time that I spend uh, about 30 to 40%, I spend, I work in this place called, uh, this company called Potter & Gamble, uh, PNG. Uh, it's a multinational company um, doing a little bit more of the occupational medicine part and uh, dermatological uh, products. Uh, if those of you who are familiar with uh, Otto & Gamble, they have products like uh, SK2, Ole, your Oral-B, um, your, some of your um, Panting yeah, and uh, Head and Shoulder, so, so some of these products. Like, yeah, and the other 10 to 20% of my time I spend teaching medical students from uh, Lee Kong Chien Medical School. Mm -hmm. I'm a house tutor there, uh, as well as uh, some of the Duke NUS uh, students attached to my clinics. And also as well, teaching uh, the doctors who are taking the diploma in family medicine. Yeah, so um, I also do some research with a PNG, Procter & Gamble, as well as a research board in Raffles Hospital. So that's my short portfolio my career, which I'm quite satisfied now, is quite a nice uh, career for me. Uh, very enjoyable, um, and uh, uh, lots of things to learn as well. Okay, uh, so today's uh, outline, right, is uh, is uh, shown. Uh, basically, uh, we'll just talk about really just a few slides. So we will just talk about these few points, uh, uh, the COVID virus update, and then what can we learn from this COVID pandemic. Uh, and then uh, my, our one well, of the plus points and the negative points of uh, of medical career, yeah. And uh, for those who are interested uh, in medical profession, uh, what are the prerequisites uh, for this medical profession? Uh, okay. So for the first um, uh, first part on the COVID virus update, uh, Andrew actually uh, gave me this question: Why is the COVID nineteen virus so dangerous? Uh, by now, we are already in the third or fourth month, uh, maybe five months uh, of the COVID virus. When it first started, it was called the China of Wuhan virus, right? Then, uh, then they call it Nova, uh, Nova uh, Corona virus uh, 19. Then they found that people find it so difficult to pronounce it, right? Then they, they shorten it and simplify it into COVID virus, which stands for coronavirus disease, right? Uh, in 2019, okay? Yeah, and why is it so dangerous? Uh, so far, Singapore has um, three viruses that uh, has affected us, right? On my time, uh, I graduated in 2000, and in year 2002, we had SARS virus. I was a public health officer. In fact, I was dealing with the contact tracing then. So uh, the SARS virus was very scary okay, because there were doctors and nurses who died. Right, and uh, it was um, as usual. We were dressed up to from uh, top to bottom. It was a difficult period, uh, but uh, we will come it within a, at least about half a year to uh, nine months. Okay, uh, then came the H one N one, and as well as the uh, MERS virus, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. H one N one was very infectious. Okay, and you know millions of people got H one N one, but then in two zero zero nine. 
when H1N1 strike, the, the government realized after a while that WHO overreacted. And uh, it was not as dangerous as, uh, as we thought. It was just, you know, something like a flu that you get. Yeah, so, uh, and whereas then came this COVID-19 virus, yeah, when, the, when China first started, uh, we all thought, you know, it's, some, one, it's another one of those uh, H1N1 virus wasn't so dangerous, okay? The, the fatality rate or mortality rate is only about 1%, 1 2%. And that's the reason why the, the American president, President Trump, uh, was not so afraid in, at the start, right? When he says that it's just a flu, we only have one or two cases. It only occurs for Asians. You won't touch the uh, Americans. Uh, he he underestimated it, and uh, now you know that uh, uh, U.S. accounts for one quarter or twenty five percent of the cases in the world. Uh, number of deaths is about eighty thousand. I think it's about eighty thousand. They have about one point three million people, uh, you know, infected with uh, COVID virus, and of course he is worried now that he will lose the election. And so this flu virus, so-called flu virus, is not so benign, but really dangerous, right? So why do we, why is this, um, you know, COVID-19 virus so dangerous? Okay, some of the speakers, the infectious disease uh, specialists, uh, you know, actually say that this is a very crafty and sneaky coronavirus. Why is that so? Okay, compared to SARS, SARS was deadly. It's about 8% to 10% death rate. Yeah, but SARS, right, uh, has symptoms when you first start. Okay, uh, for SARS, usually they have high fever, they have cough, running nose, and uh, sore throat. And uh, it, the main uh, virus shedding, right, meaning that when it's infectious, it is usually when you start with the symptoms, as, as well as uh, your last about 10 to 14 days. Okay, for um, this uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, it has one, one, uh, one uh, character that is so makes it so dangerous when you first present right you can shed the virus about four days before you show any symptoms okay one to four days okay so SARS starts from uh, you know only is infectious after a few days when you show symptoms whereas coronavirus will, will is very infectious uh, even before the start of the symptoms of like you cough running nose and sore throat okay about take about four days before that yeah so that's the first reason why that uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus is so dangerous, huh? uh, according to the virologists uh, and the infectious disease specialists. They are not able to control it now because when we first started, right, we thought that there were, uh, there were symptoms. So we thought that we can use uh, the, the preventive measures uh, that we actually, you know, uh, has practiced year after year in the, uh, in the hospitals with uh, various exercises. Uh, but just putting all these protocols uh, for this cor uh, coronavirus, COVID virus. But uh, of course, now we know that it didn't work. So when they start, right, when you start, right, you, the government tell everyone no need to wear masks, right? Yeah, because only we have symptoms that you need to wear masks, right? Then they realize that eventually they realize that uh, when they did more studies, they realized that this virus can shed for four days, okay, up to four days before the symptoms showed. Yeah, so then there's no way you can actually determine whether this person beside you, even if they're not coughing, whether they're carrying the uh, COVID virus, okay? And the other thing that uh, makes it so unique is that uh, before that for SARS, we say that it's droplets transmission, droplets tra transmission. So therefore, if you wear a mask, okay, uh, you know, you can protect against it, right? Droplet transmission meaning that, uh, we know, when you cough, you see the saliva, uh, drops that comes out, okay? So those droplets transmission, meaning that they are very heavy, they do not travel very far, about maybe one or two meters, they will fall to the ground. So it's less dangerous, okay? But when there, when there are more and more cases uh, of uh, COVID virus, they realize that uh, this COVID virus are possible can be airborne transmission as well. So what is airborne transmission? Airborne transmission meaning that they have, um, it's not just droplets, but they can be aerosol, like, you know, when you spray your uh, sanitizer, you know, the, the, the mist that came out, uh, that those are aerosol. And it can travel up to 10 meters, you know, uh, distance. And therefore, when someone just cough, even if you're standing about, you know, 5 to 10 meters away, there is a possibility you can get it. Okay, why did I say possible airborne transmission? Because now, right now, there's so, still so many things that we don't know about the virus. Yeah, 
they are postulating that it is possible airborne or aerosol transmission uh, from studies that they showed in uh, China or now in some European and American, uh, uh, you know, uh, America countries, whereby I mean, there's a large number of um, uh, uh, people gathering around uh, with COVID virus. Uh, the the sometimes the mask may not work so well. Uh, your surgical mask may not work so well. Yeah, so they realize that there's possible airborne transmission uh, when there's large gathering, and you can see that uh, this happening in Singapore to our foreign workers in the dormitories. Uh, okay, uh, the other thing that uh, the what makes uh, that makes the COVID virus so dangerous is the higher than expected death rate and infectivity. So, uh, as I said, President Trump thought that the, the this uh, virus is only one or two percent fatality rate. Later on, they realized that it's more than uh, you know five to ten percent. So if you look at uh, if you look at US, okay, where they have the most number of cases, uh, not, right now as I said, they have about eighty thousand deaths, right, uh, and uh, they have about one point two million or one point three million cases. So for those of you who are good with math, you can just roughly gauge. Let's say if hundred thousand versus over one million. Uh, cases, okay, 100,000 death over 1 million cases, so it's about 10%. So if you, a ball, ballpark figure will be about 7 to 8% death uh, fatality rate. Okay, of course they say, oh, uh, China has only 2%. Okay, nobody knows uh, what the, the experts are worried about is that we do not know whether uh, China has underreported their cases or they didn't, just didn't have the ability to test for the virus. All right. Okay, uh, I got this diagram uh, from the Straits Times. This is uh, uh, one or two weeks ago. I think it's about last week. Uh, if you can Google hit, if you like, you can go Google hit to tow um, uh, effects of COVID virus. It's in the Straits Times article. Yeah, and I thought it was uh, quite a nice picture to explain to us, uh, you know, regarding COVID virus. So unlike SARS, MERS, and uh, uh, H1N1, right, where they only affect the lungs, uh, this COVID virus is really special and dangerous. Now, why is that so? Okay, we the more the scientists uh, study study this virus, the more they found uh, about their uh, no effects on the body, each part of the body. You realize that the COVID virus can affect uh, all our organs, okay, in our body. Uh, from the top, the brain, to the heart, to the lungs, to the kidneys, and then to your even your toes. Okay, uh, and they realize, let's say for the uh, brain, you know, it can cause stroke in uh, uh, in patients. Okay, and they realize that the COVID virus just doesn't just cause cough, running nose, and just fever, and that just go away. It also causes our body to react to it. And when we react to the COVID virus, when we want to try to get rid of this COVID virus, we have this, um, um, what we call um, a phenomenon called cytokine storm, whereby we secrete a lot of hormones. And these hormones or chemicals that is secreted will cause our blood vessel in our uh, uh, body to, to, to have more blood clots. I'm not sure whether the children understand what's blood clots. Huh? Blood clots meaning that when you cut yourself, when you cut yourself, okay, if you press your uh, cut on your finger with um, sort of a tissue paper for a long time, okay, you realize the blood will, will stop. And why does it stop? Because there is blood clot forming, okay, that prevents further blood from oozing out. But when it occurs in the blood vessel, like uh, it's like your piping in your toilet, it becomes choked, okay? So these blood vessels put what does a uh, blood uh, uh, carries, you know, to your brain, to your heart? They carry oxygen. Okay, so when you have, when you have, uh, you know, blood clots, meaning that the blood vessel is is blocked up in your brain, then you have no more oxygen to your brain. So when you don't have enough oxygen to your brain, then your brain part of your brain dies off and you get a stroke. And then of course to the heart, if you have no more oxygen pro providing to the heart, the heart will stop beating. And then what does the patient get? They will get heart attack. Oh, they may get heart attack. So that's the reason why there's a, a discussion and argument now of uh, our five foreign workers who who was uh, having COVID virus. They were, didn't have any symptoms, but in the normal trees, they just drop drop 
uh, literally drop dead. Uh, and when during autopsy or the coroner's case, when they, they, they open up the body to find out what's the reason uh, of, uh, for, his, for the patient's death, they realize that it, uh, they occur from heart attack. So the postulation is whether is the COVID virus causing the blood clot in the blood vessel such that no oxygen goes to the heart and then therefore the heart stops and they get a heart attack or because, you know, the foreign worker themselves, they have diabetes, high blood pressure or some uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol, which causes them to have heart attack. So the scientist has no conclusive evidence yet. Okay, they have no conclusive evidence yet. Okay, so they, they still do not know. Okay, uh, the other thing that the COVID virus causes is that it can cause kidney failure. Okay, they can cause kidney failure. And many of those patients in the ICU, intensive care unit, that is very severe COVID virus, they have to use dialysis machine. Okay, and the dialysis machine is a machine that takes over our, our kidney to clean uh, all our chemicals. So you know you have two kidneys in your body and the two kidneys in our body, right, they are used to, to clean up our body of all your, your chemicals and all your uh, uh, byproducts like your urine and all your uh, different uh, bad products that you need to pass out to our body. So when that fails, COVID virus will make your kidney fail and when that fails, then the doctors have to put on a machine connecting to our body, to our blood vessel, and this machine will uh, take over the job of our kidney, yeah, and you will allow the blood to flow through the dialysis machine and then wash it off, okay, and make it clean, just like washing machine, then you will send back the blood to back to our uh, uh, kidney. Also, so when COVID virus uh, causes this kidney failure, and if the patient does not have the machine to help them, then they will, their life is in danger, okay? Okay, the ones on the toes are not very common. The toes, they usually say the blood clot, again, blood vessels is clogged up, no oxygen goes to your, your, your toes, and your toes actually, you know, uh, dies off. Yeah. Okay, one other um, uh, effects of this uh, COVID virus, which I didn't talk too much about it, I didn't put in this slide, lah, because it's not proven yet. Uh, if mummies uh, who has uh, read up a lot of uh, COVID virus, then you realize that there is a, uh, uh, you know, COVID virus also affects the children because at first they were saying that children, right, doesn't get affected very much by COVID virus. Okay, they say that COVID virus is much like handful mouth disease, whereby you know the symptoms are very mild, not very serious. Okay, very mild symptoms. Okay, and and uh, for the children, and then very severe symptoms for the elderly and the adults. Okay, that's handful mouth disease. Okay, so they think that at first, earlier on, when you have less cases of children, they think that COVID virus behave like the handful mouth disease. But later on, they realized that there were a few um, uh, children who got COVID overseas who had very, very severe sort of uh, symptoms. Uh, they're similar to this syndrome called Kawasaki syndrome. Yeah, and um, what causes that? Okay, what causes that? It, it's the same mechanism, meaning that the blood vessels get clogged up yeah, in the children, okay, uh, again, block in the, the children, and that wasn't the sort of like um, symptoms of the patient, whereby uh, their blood vessels get blocked up, and then some patients develop uh, symptoms similar to Kawasaki where they have heart problems, uh, and you know, uh, heart problems, heart murmurs, and things like that, yeah. Uh, so that one uh, is called multi system, okay, if you're interested, lah, uh, systemic, multi systemic. Uh, Pediatric syndrome, all right? You can stop me anytime. If you have questions, you, uh, you know, yeah, you can just stop stop me. Okay, because I'm talking medical terms, so I'm not sure whether that's how the children uh, understand. Or, not. or later on, you can ask me, okay? Okay, so what are the lessons from this COVID pandemic? What can we learn from the current crisis? Okay, yeah, so I came up with just very, sim three very simple points that I even teach to my, my children that the post-COVID virus pandemic, the world will be very different. I'm sure you read the newspaper, they have said uh, it will be very different. Yeah, so, and many of you are affected, right? Because now, now you are actually having your school, halfway through your school holidays. When school holiday is supposed to start usually in June, right? And not in May. Huh? But uh, for now, it starts in uh, May because of the COVID virus and we have circuit breaker. Okay, so all of you have to be at home 
and then you have to have a very steep learning curve on how to uh, uh, do this zoom yeah so before 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 i you know uh, before this COVID virus i, I seldom use zoom i only use uh, some of my webex or zoom for my Procter and gamble uh, patients uh, because some of them may be overseas sometimes they they, they are in another place so i i may use the video con consultation with them but then there i've never, not really used zoom before yeah but uh, during these two two months you know within these weeks i started um, learning zoom so i started teaching the medical students in the Kong Chen medical school uh, using zoom and each medical student has given a free account of zoom zoom account and i also you know teaches the diploma uh, those doctors are taking diploma in family medicine using Zoom. Uh, certainly, it's not easy. Yeah, and there's a, quite a lot of skills involved. I'm not the best. I'm not really good at technology. Uh, but uh, um, I guess this is a different world that we are going to live in uh, post-COVID uh, virus. Okay. Then you, could, you also realize that there are many other promising careers besides medical profession, right? Um, yeah, such as research, okay, and people can uh, sort of like develop test kits, you know, testing for COVID virus. So that is a very promising uh, career. And then Singapore has just produced the uh, the one of the first uh, test kit for COVID virus uh, testing for the the antibodies, the the neutralizing antibodies, which Daniel just now wrote in the question, right? Um, uh, that the that our body produces to neutralize the the COVID virus early in the incubation period, right? Then of course computer science, as you know, uh, Zoom the company Zoom before that was um, not so popular um, uh, video sort of uh, conferencing uh, company. Uh, but uh, uh, over just within these two three months, the company has grown very very big and invite uh, and actually. Uh, got a lot more investment for investors, right? Because uh, suddenly everyone need to use Zoom to 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 communicate, right? Mm -hmm. So in the computer science, uh, is one of the hardest to enter in uh, in the NUS. One of my clinical assistant uh, son, he just uh, got a, a place in NUS uh, computer science, and he he's from uh, Raffles Junior College, and uh, he's almost at straight A. So it's not easy to get into computer science now because this era. Um, it will be a different era whereby computers and technology will take a large part of our uh, um, of time, <clears throat> a large part of our life as well. Then, of course, we are uh, uh, doing this circuit breaker. You know that I'm here now in the clinic because I'm part of the essential services industry. I realized that uh, many of my people that I know uh, who are in maybe careers such as um, in the media, uh, and in the entertainment uh, uh, career, they actually literally stop their work. And uh, those who doesn't uh, have a fixed salary, they actually, you know, uh, are living on their uh, savings. Okay. The second uh, uh, and the third point is self sufficiency and speed up uh, automation. So, uh, well, just for maybe the children's learning, uh, before before COVID. Uh, Singapore usually, you know, is a is a country uh, whereby we actually import everything from uh, the world. So we don't really have any natural resources. Uh. At first, we didn't have water, but now we have uh, new water. Yeah, and we don't have uh, much, uh, you know, vegetable farms, pig farms, animal farms for us to produce. Right? Then you realize that uh, when Malaysia actually closed the border. We, our government, no, I wouldn't say panic, but you know, they, they are worried that we will not be able to get enough food, right? So they realized that uh, actually Singapore uh, needs to be self-sufficient, okay? So in terms of food-wise, the government is thinking, you know, by 2030, they're going to increase our food production to 30% of what Singaporeans eat uh, every year, right? Then uh, the other um, lesson from self-sufficiency is that earlier on, you realize that our government told us not to wear masks. Okay, that is advised by the WHO. Okay, that is international advice. So the WHO, World Health Organization, also got it wrong. They thought it was not, um, uh, it's unlikely to be an aerosol or um, uh, this um, a transmission. They think that it's droplets. 
Yeah, so they say there's no need to wear masks unless you are sick. Yeah, then they realize that it, it can occur when people have no symptoms and it could be airborne. So then the WHO says that we, we need masks, right? That's what I mentioned. So early on, our government says that we don't need, we do not need to wear masks. It's partly reason because Singapore does not produce surgical masks, the blue masks. We had a few companies, but they, they the companies actually close up, close down. Why? Because we are producing the masks and more expensive than the China, uh, you know, China companies can make, Chinese com com companies can make. So, so right now we actually have uh, surgical mask production. Okay, we brought back our machines a few months ago. The doctors know it. You all may not know it, but now it's in the newspaper. But a few months ago, we know that they brought back the machines uh, for surgical masks from Taiwan. Okay, well, our ST engineering company produces surgical masks over there. But when, when Taiwan closed up the country, we brought back the machines here to produce the masks. All right. And then, of course, um, post COVID, we, we know that we probably the government will change and then they're going to look into. Uh, a lot of uh, how to speed up the automation of all companies, okay? Yeah, and the reason for this, um, I think the main impetus for them to do that is the um, unfortunate large number of uh, our foreign workers who are working here, they have contracted uh, COVID virus. Yeah, so I think that will actually push the government to produce more of the, the mask, okay? If you look at the, the, the graph just now uh, on the right side, I just pulled out some of these pictures, but just now I didn't, didn't explain it. Uh, basically, the graph is nothing much. It's just trying to show from a study in um, um, in from China. Yeah, because China they actually produce a lot of studies, not really good quality, but it's a lot of studies, uh, and it's published in a very notable uh, this uh, reputable um, journals called Lancet and uh, New England Journal, New England Medical Journal. Okay, so the graph actually just show just trying to show you that compared to SARS, this um, Virus, right, is uh, shed, the virus is most infectious and it shed the most amount of virus within the first seven days of the symptoms. First seven days of the symptoms, right? So after seven days, so there's a window of period where actually the, the doctors can, can uh, swap the patients, okay? And, uh, and, and you know, if you, if you swap the patients too early, you may not get a, a positive case, although the patient actually had COVID, still incubating. Okay, if you swap the virus too late, also you may not have enough virus inside there to be, make it positive. Okay, so 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 that that graph is just trying to show you uh, the various uh, patients getting COVID virus. Yeah, so that's how scientists actually find out the characteristic of the the virus. Okay, they collect number of patients, they take their blood, measure it, then they they realize that oh, this SARS virus uh, has most number of amount of virus from uh, day day seven to fourteen, okay. Day four, seven to fourteen are symptoms. Whereas uh, this COVID virus, they measure the blood, they realize that the the, the virus right uh, is highest right from the start. Okay, yeah. So COVID virus right, it doesn't just uh, slowly increase the amount of virus as the symptoms get more and more days. Uh, right from the start, the first three days of the 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 symptoms started, it has the most amount of virus shedding. So meaning, when is it most infectious? When is it most likely to pass to people? Actually, early on, when they first few days when they show symptoms, yeah. So that's again one of the point that I miss out. Why it's so dangerous, uh, for the COVID virus? Okay. Well, I, I do. I have this question here that about how should the parents and children react to the current crisis? Um. Well, I, I first didn't really know how to answer this, but uh, I, I guess for for me, even though I'm in the, uh, in in uh, I'm a medical doctor in a clinic. And our clinic is one of the public health preparedness clinic, PHPC. And we also do swap COVID tests for in our clinics. I'm actually not so worried compared to SARS, right? SARS, as I said, SARS, we were caught off guard. We were not very well prepared. Uh, but over the years, every year we have exercises. Um, we have exercises to, to train our, our healthcare workers on how to deal, uh, uh, what, what should they do when there is a, uh, uh, epidemic again when the SARS virus comes back again, and then so that so that therefore our uh, hospitals and the clinics are really well prepared this round. Yeah, so if you look at my photo, actually I'm uh, actually covered from head to toe. Uh, at first I, I I gave a photo of um, one with wearing goggles and <laughs> my face shield and face face mask and uh, yeah, Andrew was saying uh, looks a little bit scary, <laughs> so I took out all the. 
uh, all the the different protective uh, gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is it is uh, uh, we're a lot more well, well prepared now. So there's no need to uh, panic because this too will pass. Uh, and our government has done a very very good job. I have many many foreigners in my clinic who actually praise my our government compared to Japan, compared to US, uh, where they have no clear guidelines. Singapore here is very very clear guidelines. What we need to do is that every one of you, uh, including children and your parents, please you know follow what the, the government says. Now wear a mask if you can. Try not to go out and stay at home. And then therefore they can help our healthcare workers. Uh, for getting too many infections, yeah, okay. Uh, I for for myself, I use this opportunity to impart medical and public health knowledge to my to my children. Okay, not that any one of them wants to be a doctor. Yeah, they are interested in science, uh, but they may not want to be a doctor. But uh, I find that this is a very good opportunity for me. Uh, even parents as well. If you read out a lot about science. Uh, a lot about COVID virus. This is a real life lesson that we can learn as it changes. You know, as I get guidelines from the MOH, I actually ask questions to my 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 children and say, why do you think that? Why do you think that the government actually at first uh need to have a suspect case definition? Like no one, not everyone in Singapore can have a COVID virus test or a swab test because we have not enough resources, right? So in the public health uh perspective. We need to prioritize the, the swabbing and the testing to those who need it most. So then the government will, will, will define, the public health specialists will define then all the symptoms inside there. You know, you must, the patient must have cough, running nose, sore throat, and fever for four days before we can swab the patient. If you have no fever, starting on, uh, when they think that there's, you need to have fever, just like SARS, they say you must have fever so that we can test. If you have no fever, my patient comes in and uh, cough, cold, running nose, I will say, sorry, because you don't meet the suspect case definition, I cannot swap you, I cannot do the test for you. Even if you have a lot of money to pay, we cannot give you. But later on, when the government realized that asymptomatic, there's no symptoms also can pass on, then they they started to, uh, you know, say that, okay, for foreign workers or healthcare workers who have no, no fever, but they have cough, cold, or running nose, you can get to swap as well, because they know that these are the high risk areas all right okay so that's how i use this opportunity you know to it's like a question and answer and i will we just share during lunch time or a dinner time where we have family dinner then uh, my wife will somehow read the bible or uh, the you know some history to them i will talk to them about covid virus okay it's a life lesson now a very good opportunity for us to teach our children okay and what else we learn uh, we, we all realize that you know um, for children to learn uh, the parents must really uh, be more, uh, involved in the learning because many of our kids look up to us and they actually, you know, we spend a lot of time also with our children. And if parents can be more involved during, uh, uh, with their children's learning, they will learn faster, okay? So, I mean, this uh, COVID virus actually taught me that because I'm staying at home more. I'm working three days per week uh, because Procter & Gamble closed the clinic there, so I do not have to... Uh, you know, work there, I will just, you know, sort of doing WebEx and Zoom uh, videos or even by emails with their, whatever that they need to ask me. It's a sort of a consultation, uh, consultancy work. Yeah, so so I have a lot more time with children. So I realized that, you know, parents can be, should be more involved in the children's learning. And uh, one uh, lesson that we, I, we taught to our children, that this, uh, this pandemic, this COVID virus pandemic, Makes us realize that you yeah, actually very very little to survive. Okay, yeah, you 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 don't have your bubble tea. <laughs> you cannot go to cinema. You cannot uh, you know go to maybe uh, entertainment areas. Uh, the zoo is closed as well. But well, life still goes on, and we can actually survive with very little. Okay, uh, the ups and downs of the medical career. Okay, uh, share with us about choosing a career in the medical profession. Okay, so I divided it into plus points and minus points. Okay, it was my childhood dream to be a teacher. Yeah, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, but I guess I only got the interview from medical school. And uh, actually, the interview didn't, well, didn't go very well. <laughs> I wasn't very well prepared. Uh, but I guess they were looking at my way I answer the questions, whether I'm resilient, whether how I, I have the passion for this uh, career. And uh, well, God, 
allows me to go into the, the this very noble career as well. Uh, so um, just like a teacher, they are respected uh, doctors uh, at this moment. Uh, uh, hopefully in the near future also, you will still be a respected profession. I think it's something, it's a nice job to be able to help someone and while you still earn the salary. Yeah, so so to me, I enjoy med- medicine. Yeah, I was telling my students, uh, you know, it's, it, it's nice to be paid uh, a salary for doing something that uh, you're passionate about and God has given you the, all the gifting for it. Yeah. And by now, you will realize that this uh, iron rice bowl, compared to the gig job and the entrepreneur, uh, we have no fixed pay. Uh, uh, this iron rice bowl thing also it has a difference. I'm in the private practice. Uh, my classmates who are in, uh, who are senior consultants or professors in the, the hospitals are getting better now because government has fixed pay. Uh, our, you know, private one may, the drop, salary may drop a little bit, uh, but you no, know, in healthcare is still sort of like iron rice bowl during this uh, period. Uh, yeah. Of course, we are not saying that we are there for the money. Okay. All of us who want to be doctors, we know our first is our patients. You know, first, you must have love for your patients before you come into medicine. Yeah, but uh, it's still a very stable job. And I like stable job, uh, just like teacher and uh, uh, doctors. I don't have to think. Uh, every day I just go to do my work that I like. And then uh, I, will, I will be able to have, um, to be able to raise up my family uh, comfortably. Yeah. Okay. Um, as you can look at the pictures on the right side, uh, these are pictures that we, a mission trip that we went recently to West Timor, uh, West Timor, uh, which is beside East Timor. Okay, West Timor is part of uh, Indonesia. And uh, it, it, um, so uh, my medical skills came very, very useful. These are plasma again. My medical skills came up very useful during this mission work. And uh, even my children, I taught them to help me, you know, to measure uh, the blood pressure machine and to take notes. Uh, my second daughter was helping with that. My son uh, taking notes, uh, which you can take good notes of ladies, right? And then my elder son is help. You can see the photo here, helping them to, uh, you know, give out uh, uh, um, toys to the children. And uh, this West Timor uh, place, uh, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, um, and uh, we, I mean, my skills came in useful. There was a nurse who came came with me as well, and the nurse could could, could get some donations from uh, the specialists to take uh, give out medication for them for those who have symptoms are uh, coming to see us uh, it was very popular uh, and because many of these uh, uh, children and uh, even adults over there they are living in the remote mountains they do not have enough uh, doctors and nurses there so they need uh, someone to come over there we were very happy that we can help them with it yeah so uh, so this is a plus point for me now Last point for me, okay. A uh, minus point, okay. As you from this COVID virus now, uh, everyone knows about it, right? Yeah, my 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 children and my wife always share uh, this uh, YouTube uh, video of Ling Ling. Ling uh, Ling Ling is a fictional um, character that uh, is typical of the Asian uh, Singaporean mentality. You can train thirty six hours for the violin, and then the parents of Ling Ling actually told uh, Ling Ling now, uh, don't be a doctor now, and don't you know because why? Because there's risk, health risk, right? Firstly, there is a uh, huge mental health problems, right? Uh, stress to the to the doctors, right? And uh, we uh, it occurs during different periods, like SARS, H one one wasn't too much. We don't remember much for it. But COVID virus, yeah, we do remember uh, much about it, right? And then there's also uh, risk to your physical health, like you know, I'm we always worried like in the clinic when I go back to my, uh, after work when I go back, I will usually. Uh, take off my clothes, uh, bathe, take off my clothes without touching my children, no hugging. Right? I have to clean myself thoroughly before I speak to them Okay, because I'm worried that I'll pass to them. Okay, The minus point, of course, is expensive to study medicine. Uh, it, it costs about thirty to 40000 a year to study medicine. So uh, about even in Singapore, we're talking about Singapore, in, uh, if you're five year course in the Lee Kong Chien Medical School, it costs about hundred and hundred fifty to 200000 right? And then in Duke NUS, which is a four-year postgraduate studies, is uh it, it is four years, so it's about hundred sixty thousand. Uh, Yong Luli is slightly cheaper. The NUS one is cheaper, but it also takes up about hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, medicine uh is not easy. It's a sleep learning curve. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I've 
I've actually told you a little bit, right, about what are the prerequisites for medical profession. I, I think these are the simple things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the passion, uh, passion for it, right? You, what does it take to be a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic? You need to have a passion for it. If you have no passion for a uh, medical career, uh, uh, please don't go into that, uh, this career because it, it can be really, very really stressful. I have a classmate who have dropped out of medicine. I have classmates who became doctor, but later on didn't want to be a doctor anymore. Uh, I don't, for various reasons, of course. Um, but it really, you really need that passion and the love of uh, medicine uh, you know, to persist in, uh, in this job. And that's the reason why you go for interviews there in the medical career. They often, one of these uh, questions, they will ask you, what do you want to be a doctor? What do you want to be a nurse? Yeah, what do you want to be a paramedic, right? Yeah, so you, you need to think through. And uh, for us, we are Christians, we pray about it. Yeah, I always tell them, say that what God has given you, the right, uh, you know, skills for it, then you go for it. If not, uh, please uh, do not go into medical career. Okay, and of course, my uh, children will say, oh, daddy, you work so hard, you know, you work, work uh, hard work, and you need to have resilience to it. And I'll say, maybe I don't want to be, uh, you know, a doctor or a nurse uh, eventually. Yeah, so being a doctor, you need hard work and resilience. And, it's, and all the more in COVID virus uh, pandemic, uh, we uh, when we face uh, patients with uh, you know possible COVID virus, we need, we need to we need to take good care. We need to uh, you know dress ourselves uh, with all the protective equipment, and uh, we also have must have the mental resilience that you know we we while taking care of ourselves, we also give our best to our, our patient, right? Yeah, and again in the medical school, they will always teach you that we are professional. And our profession is a noble. Uh, profession uh, and I will always say in our, our profession first don't first do no harm okay and there's uh, first do no harm to the patients and uh, at the same time we say that you know we uh, are doctors right we need to be ethical yeah so uh, it, 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 this profession itself uh, is with quite a small family and then um, uh, we need to conduct ourselves with integrity so if a doctor also outside our career, outside our career, we have some uh, criminal records. It actually affects our, our, our career. Yeah, yeah. So these are not the uh, easy things. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And the last part is preparation for the medical career. Okay. Yeah. So I'm actually not sure what else we can talk. They say, okay, no one can ask me uh, questions on it. Okay. Yeah. But uh, actually... Actually, uh, the picture that you show, show below, right, uh, is a huge reservoir. Uh, and uh, uh, the one standing beside me is a SIA pilot, right? It's an SIA pilot called Captain Booty. I don't know if sure anyone know, know him. He actually won the CNN uh, Hero Award before, uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, because he was an SIA pilot then. And then he went to East, Tim East Timor during war time, and he saw many of the orphans. Uh, parents were killed, and then the orphans had no one to take care of them. So he brought all the orphans over to West Timor, which we visited, right? And then uh, set an orphanage there and uh, educate them. And then actually one of the, the orphanage children, child, she became a doctor, uh, you know, when she grows up. When he grows up. Yeah, and the reservoir behind that you see there is actually uh, sponsored by Coca-Cola, for an American company, because their area is uh, not enough water. So they need irrigation and, and, and Coca-Cola actually sponsor it to, to, to uh, make a reservoir for them to help him uh, grow, grow his uh, plantations, uh, which they are self-sufficient. Yeah. So part of the preparation of the medical career, also uh, they talk about preparation of a portfolio. I'm, I'm there with my children, of course, not because of the portfolio, uh, but because we wanted to volunteer, want to do something. It's good education for my children. Uh, but uh, uh, that's one of these things that uh, between now to uh, if you apply for medical school and you get the interview, uh, it'd be good that you have some parts of the this um, uh, over the time uh, things to show to the to the panel that uh, you you are someone really passionate uh, for this job lah. Yeah. Okay. I must confess during my interview I didn't have any of this. <laughs> that's why I didn't do so well for the interview. It doesn't matter, right? Okay. So the take-home messages, uh, just these few things I 
uh, this my I most of my talks when I give a lot used to give a lot of talks in, as an assistant director in the hospital previously. I always end with this. Uh, this is my life philosophy that uh, we need to plan for health. We think of do financial planning, and most important because we're Christian, we we pray a lot. We pray a lot and we put God in first place. Okay, okay, and uh, it's one of my favorite verse from uh, the the Bible that this COVID virus actually taught us, right? That you know. Life is uncertain. Nothing is certain. All right. So even for the medical career, you want to get in med school, uh, people preparing a lot of people preparing a portfolio of the the for their medical interview, but they eventually may not still get into the they did not pass the interview to get into medical school, and that's not because they're no good, but because uh, Singapore cannot have all the talented people or the smart people going to the medical career. They still need some people who are engineers, who are lawyers, who are accountants. You know, so so uh, you know you need to leave some of the talents for the other professions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a mountain in uh, East Timor uh, with a nurse there and uh, the other people help. <laughs> By IV, when is yeah. the likely time for vaccination to be developed and brought to the masses? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So is anyone guess? Uh, we have attended so many talks by the infectious disease uh, professors. Uh, Anyone guess? Uh, they, they say usually a vaccine takes two to three years uh, to develop because there are four phases of uh, clinical trials. Like, you no, know, now I'm doing clinical trials with um, um, uh, in Raffles Hospital, right, in the research board. So when they come to us, it's phase three. Phase three cancer drug, which I'm going to do one for, uh, in, next week I'll be attending the research board in um, Raffles Hospital. Phase three needs one to two years. One to two years just to control phase three. So for first phase one is uh, animals. It tests on animals and tests on cells. So that it takes about maybe a uh, few months because it's just very simple. Then phase two can be uh, still animals or can be uh, humans. They are so some of the vaccines are in phase two now. A few of them there are eight vaccines. Uh, they are testing four of them from China. I think two from US and two from Europe. Uh, in the phase two, Singapore we only have uh, one vaccine trial. Uh, and we are testing the RNA, slightly different from the DNA that they are testing. Uh, so we are developing an RNA vaccine. And this R uh, mRNA uh, is still at phase one, I think, because they didn't even say they were phase two. So uh, Trump and China, they are racing to be the first country in the world to be, you know, to produce the vaccine. So it's political. So so Trump said by the end, November, when after I get elected, didn't know I will have the vaccine. But uh, if you if you watch CNN, the very famous doctor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is an infectious disease uh, expert, he says that uh, that's not true. At least half, one and a half to two years later. That's the reason why COVID virus actually changed the whole world. Yeah. Right. Can I explain how COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, affects the respiratory symptom, system? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, Yen. Uh, so just like SARS, uh, it is uh, it's, you, it's a respiratory virus. So the virus stays in our lungs, actually predominantly in our lungs, but that's not the picture. Head to toe, I didn't explain about respiratory virus. So it's like what uh, Daniel said, it stays in our virus, it causes infection, our body reacts to it. Our body is very easy. That means our body saw the virus as an enemy, they produce antibody and secret a lot of hormones, chemicals to stop the virus. But at the same time, our body in reacting to it also attack ourselves. How does it do it? Like you say, the air sacs filled with water, okay, to uh, have fever, and then uh, when it's filled with water and we attack our cells, somebody killing the virus also kill part of our cells in our respiratory system. So they have this thing in China when they first saw COVID, they they didn't do swab tests. They did CT scan, which is a scan that you go through and they can X-ray all your lungs to diagnose COVID virus, and they have this picture called glass light picture. Look like a frosted glass, like uh, which they have this syndrome called adult respiratory um, uh, AR ARDS disease syndrome, right? So meaning adult respiratory distress syndrome, meaning that the the patient is in distress because the lung is filled with all water, is filled with all water. They cannot breathe, you know. So it's like a balloon. If you your balloon, our, our lungs is made of many many small balloons. Okay, if you put water in the balloons, can you still blow in the balloon? You can't blow it and you cannot expand it, right? Yeah, so that, that, that's how it kills it. So when patients have this um, problem, what does the doctor do? Just now, Kingy, we say we have a machine, dialysis machine, right? So this one, we have a machine uh, that helps us to breathe, call ventilator, you take over the breathing. You put the, the patient to sleep, okay? Semi-sleep. You'll see he's sleeping, then the machine will help 
take over the breathing core ventilator. Mm. Yeah. Uh, hope that, I hope that answered the question. The question box. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, if the question is, if COVID is aerosol-based, then can surgical masks really protect us? Yeah, that's an um, interesting thing see. But the thing about it is that we don't have enough N95 masks. And then if you have worn N95 masks previously, uh, like, you know, for, for me, some of the patients are, we have cough and cold, I wear N95. It, you may not be able to breathe uh, so well, you know, for the whole day. So, and this... Um, uh, surgical mask does help a little bit because there's still droplets, right? Besides aerosol, there's still droplets. So that's what the Prime Minister Lee is trying to tell you, right? There are two types of masks. One is surgical mask, one is your uh, reusable mask. So the reusable mask doesn't have a filter from the outside, right? It doesn't have a filter from outside. So it cannot, if the virus comes in, it still goes to us because there's no filter or because the virus are very, very small particles. They are not, they are not the big ones, droplets, one that, you know, but it can stop maybe the droplets uh, and then at the same time, you can stop yourself when you're coughing, the droplets are going out to other people. Okay. But so it's good to ask everyone to wear surgical masks and reusable masks, right? Yeah, the, this uh, uh, surgical mask has um, uh, three layers. Okay. So the inner a layer, right? Uh, by now, I think you all should know the inner layer is to absorb all our, yes, absorbent, and you absorb all our cough, you know, droplets into it. Yeah. So, so and then outer, outer uh, layer, the blue one, will help to reflect any droplets that goes to it. So it's still good to wear a surgical mask. It protects against the droplets, right? It protects against the droplets. The other thing they talk about is when people wear masks, there's this thinking that they have to be careful. Yeah, so so many of my patients were saying it earlier. So uh, the Taiwan uh, uses masks and Hong Kong uses masks. Why Singapore don't want to use masks? At least they have a habit of doing it. They are being, they, they, know, they, they need to be careful. Yeah, so they have this impression uh, when they wear surgical masks. Yeah. Okay, one last question yeah. I think related to this is uh, Dr. Tan, do you think it's still recommended for kids to use masks when they return to school in June? So maybe quickly just. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that one of us will leave it to uh, MOE and uh, MOH uh, uh, experts to, to say. Yeah. I mean, my personal opinion is that it would be good for them to wear masks. Uh, but the problem is that the children, being children, uh, it's not easy for, for them to wear the mask the whole day. So they may not uh, want to wear masks. Why, why we would like them to wear masks? Because remember, children, when they cough, sometimes they may not cover the mouth, right? So, so it at least can catch the droplets. If they catch the droplets, then more people around them will not get it. Yeah, you know, so, so I, think, I think it's good if they can wear masks. Okay. And one more, can I say that three-ply surgical masks is better than reusable cough masks? Yes. Okay. So, so that's the reason why at the start, the, the government didn't give you reusable mask because they think that it's useless, right? <laughs> because it doesn't filter. It doesn't filter at all. So, so when WHO at the start says no need to wear mask, so the government also said no need to wear mask since we don't have enough surgical mask, right? Only prioritize it for the healthcare workers. And it was the right decision because our healthcare workers compared to US where 20% of 10 to 20% of their, their patients are healthcare workers. Singapore only about five or six uh, doctors getting it so so uh, that was the you know you know it's a good thing right yeah so so reusable masks they don't have filter so you can only catch your own droplets yeah so but it's still useful like, we only catch your own droplets everyone wears it and they, their droplets doesn't pass to other people then you know that is the um, you know the infectivity and the spreading is less right but it's certainly less uh, effective than three, three ply right Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Um, yeah, we can't yeah. give you a round of applause because we are all no, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we can actually. We can turn on okay, okay, okay. But really, yeah. thank you very much for spending time with us and also uh, giving okay. us so much information to the parents and the students. Sure. Okay, so, sure. thank you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> then we'll give you a round of okay. applause. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so okay. much, everyone. Thank you to all the parents, students, yeah. and yes, happy to see all of you here. Okay, goodbye.